Welcome to our new series of Nature Trek podcasts, where we bring wildlife to you in your living room. In this episode, urban peregrines taking the city by storm with Ed Druitt and Sarah Frost. Hello everybody and thank you for joining us. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's marketing manager, normally based in the head office in the lovely village of Chawton. But today this podcast is brought to you from my DIY home recording studio in Alton. Joining us today is tour leader Ed Druitt, coming to you from the Forest of Dean. Now, Ed, you've been leading for Nature Trek since 2008, and in fact, we co-led together on my first ever Nature Trek tour, uh, which I remember well. That was our Spitsbergen cruise. Right. And anyone I've ever spoken to on my tours that I've led subsequently, um, who's also, also travelled with you, uh, has, uh, is always unfailing to describe you as extremely enthusiastic and charismatic. <laughs> And you've been a naturalist for over 30 years with a particular interest in birds, haven't you? Um, Yes, that's right. And I know that this passion uh, you have for communicating the wonders of natural history um, means that you're never far away from the media. You're regularly involved with broadcasting on TV and radio, which ranges from appearances on The One Show to Spring Watch, Autumn Watch, Radio 4, Natural History Radio and BBC Radio Bristol, just to name a few. Um, and the destinations that you've been taking nature trek groups to um, since 2008 include Madagascar, Canada, the Gambia Azores and Antarctica and loads more fantastic mouth-watering yeah. destinations in between. So, Solomon Islands and Antarctica oh, Solomons, of course. my most recent highlights. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so there's hundreds of questions that I'm really just bursting to ask you but um, about all of those travels. But today we're just going to focus on learning all about something actually a bit closer to home. And this is your work with peregrine falcons. So a lot of people will be familiar with what a peregrine falcon roughly looks like. Yet some particularly beginner birders or perhaps people who've simply just never taken the time to actually look out for them before might not feel confident at identifying them. So can you tell us how to spot one and how to distinguish it from, say, a sparrowhawk or a hobby or a kestrel? So a peregrine, first of all, is a big bird of prey. It's one of our fastest birds of prey. So when it's flying a level flight, it's no faster than a pigeon. But actually, when it's stoop diving down, it's incredibly fast. But you don't tend to see that very often. What you do tend to see more is a peregrine perched on a cliff, and more so these days, actually perched on a building. And I reckon that in places like Bristol, for example, you're actually more likely to see a peregrine than you are for example a kestrel or a buzzard or even a sparrowhawk i think the key thing though about a peregrine sarah is that one they are big so they're kind of crow sized birds they're not as big as a buzzard they're more crow sized birds and when you see them flying like the hobby that you mentioned kestrel merlin they're part of the falcon family so they have these very long pointy wings And when peregrines tend to fly, they have almost like a sort of fluttery flight. They tend to have quite shallow wing beats as they're flying along, but quite a big, broad body, smallish head and uh, a tail that actually doesn't look as long as it would in, say, something like a kestrel. A kestrel is smaller than a peregrine, but it looks much longer tailed when it's flying. And you've also got things like a sparrowhawk, for example. If you see a sparrowhawk, instead of a sparrowhawk having those long pointed wings of a peregrine, it has much broader, more rounded wings. And when a sparrowhawk flies, unlike a kestrel or a peregrine, it goes flap, flap and glide, flap, flap and glide. Whereas a peregrine is always sort of flapping its, its, its wings in this kind of shallow, shallow way and what have you. Mm. The other thing is that if you are in a town or city, so if people are out and about at the moment on their sort of one walk a day, looking uh, around maybe an urban area where they live, or even rural areas as well. Peregrines love to perch. They're often a very upright bird perched against a cliff face or on a building and what have you. And if the weather's not particularly kind of great, often when it's wet as well, they'll often just sit there all day long until the weather gets a bit better for them. Um, so you're referring here quite often to, uh, to urban peregrines, really. And we, we do see them in towns and cities. And certainly that's where I've seen the majority of the ones that I've seen. But isn't their normal habitat cliffs or quarries or rocky sea coasts? Why do we see them in towns and cities? Yeah, so up until about the 1980s or so, you generally, as a rule, would have seen peregrines maybe along the coastline around the UK, perhaps up in the mountains of Snowdonia and in Cumbria and Scotland. And 
since the 1980s, really, when peregrine numbers have been recovering from a whole variety of things, but in particular, the effects of pesticides that were used in the countryside in the 1950s and 1960s. Once those were banned, peregrines started to come back to former haunts, for example, along the coastlines. But they also started to come much more into, into inland quarries and also into urban locations. And we're seeing this not just in Britain, but all across Europe, uh, the Americas, Australia, places like that. So there's something, something ab about the fact that, you know, now they haven't got pressures of perhaps being shot and poisoned and all those sorts of things. They're a, they've been expanding and into a whole variety of habitats. So wherever you are in the country at the moment, you've got a really good chance of seeing a peregrine, whether in moorland, coastlines, near quarries and, and urban locations. And we've got over 1,700 pairs of peregrines in, in the UK, and of, of which close to sort of 200 pairs are now in urban locations. So most big towns and cities, certainly in England, but also in parts of Wales, South Wales, parts of Scotland, have urban peregrines now in them. Wow, fantastic. I remember actually being out in Winchester last summer with some Nature Trek office staff. Uh, we uh, just went out for an evening meal as a member of staff was leaving and we were in a restaurant next to Winchester Cathedral. Um, and our staff are all very keen naturalists and sharp spotters. So we saw one whiz past the window of the restaurant and mm -hmm. go over to the cathedral. Um, and uh, they have a, a camera set up there. Uh, so you can watch them live on the nest. Um, indeed, that's what um, many of the staff enjoyed doing for the rest of the evening meal, uh, was streaming this live um, on their phones. So why, why are cathedrals of all places favoured nesting sites for them? Is it simply because they're good, uh, it's a good point about elevation for surveying their territory? or? So with peregrines, it's a, it's a little bit like urban gulls, where a lot of buildings in urban locations have flat open roofs that, that for gulls replicate islands, basically. So lesser backpack gulls tend to sort of roost, for example, on big flat open roofs. Herring gulls will often nest in chimneys, which replicate the smaller cliffs that, that herring gulls would use, say, around the islands of Scoma and Pembrokeshire. And so for peregrines, it's the same sort of thing. When you look at what cathedrals and churches are made out of, they're made out of generally sandstone and limestone. And those sort of replicate exactly the same sort of cliff structures you get in quarries, which I guess to some degree are man-made in the sense that they've been quarried out by people to, to produce cliffs. But also they replicate perhaps the sort of coastline cliffs that you'd also get. So I think peregrines mm -hmm. are very much coming in land and and... To them they don't really see a cathedral they see basically a tall limestone or sandstone cliff which has all sorts of nooks and crannies just like a natural sea cliff would have and so it provides the perfect conditions and perfect places really for peregrines to perch and um, hide their prey they cache their prey away and and things like that really and, and of course we're seeing more nesting now as well mm. and the great thing is, is that I started studying peregrines just over 20 years ago and back then you had this kind of you know, you might remember these, these the sort of the web cameras where they updated every minute or half a minute if you were lucky. And it was quite a grainy footage. And today, many of these cameras that are on urban peregrines, including Winchester, have much better quality cameras. They're streaming live, often on YouTube, um, but not always. And the fabulous thing is that over the coming months, actually, there's a, a really great opportunity to really watch these birds from your living room or, or your bedroom or wherever. And peregrines at the moment, we're kind of talking uh, right at the very end of March. So most peregrines are going down on eggs now and some of them are still laying. Some have already got full clutches. So throughout April, they're going to be incubating. Throughout May, they're going to be hatching and feeding those chicks. So wherever you are in the country, it's worth seeing if there are cameras on perhaps local peregrines. There's definitely cameras on Exeter, uh, like you said, Winchester. We've got Wakefield and Sheffield and Nottingham. We've got some on London peregrines, such as Sutton uh, and Morden, for example. Where else? I'm trying to think where else now. But, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a variety of different. Leamington Spa in the Midlands. So there's lots of different cameras out there at the moment following the peregrines. And, and giving us, really, the intimate chance to see these birds up close, but from our homes. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Maybe we could include a link at the end of um, this uh, podcast and uh, for our listeners and our, link, our listeners can, uh, can click on that and, yeah, and see definitely. if they can find a, a video that's uh, closer to home for them. So you've touched on the, the persecution that peregrines uh, suffered from a, a few years ago with pesticides and things, because they were actually quite rare really across Britain, weren't they? Especially in the 60s yeah, absolutely. Um, when they suffered a lot due to pesticides in the food chain. 
and now they do seem to be doing much better. Are they doing well all across Britain or is it just in cities or just in particular areas of Britain? So there's two things there. First of all, yeah, if we just go back in time, in the early 1900s, they were still not even recovering, really. You know, they'd been persecuted during the Victorian periods and before then, really, um, so that they didn't eat. Um, they were seen as vermin, basically. So they were often shot and killed. Then you had taxidermy in the Victorian periods. And then during the Second World War, they were shot as part of the Ministry of Air Defence to stop them from actually intercepting pigeons that were carrying important messages. Oh, so blimey. it wasn't until after insecticides that were being used in the countryside, DDT was being used on cereals, crops, and it was realised that there was a link between that spraying and declining populations of not just peregrines, but also other birds of prey and animals like otters, that it was banned. And then it also coincided with Peregrines becoming protected. So in, we, we, in the 1980s, we had the Wildlife and Countryside Act that protected mm. all wildlife, including the peregrines. Um, and since then, they've been doing probably better than they've ever done for hundreds of years, I would imagine. Yes, I see that they're now what's called a, a Schedule 1 listed species of the country uh, of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So what, what does that mean for them as Schedule so, so the fact that peregrines are what we call Schedule 1 licensed means that they... Unlike a blackbird or a blue tit, for example, they have extra protection. So because they almost went extinct in Britain and because they are still vulnerable to being persecuted and they're still vulnerable, they're, because they're a top predator, they're still vulnerable to big changes or, or even subtle changes sometimes that can happen in the environment. So they are alongside barn owls and bitterns and other rarer breeding birds in Britain, they're protected under what we call schedule one. So that means that whereas I could go up to a blackbird nest and maybe just check how many eggs or chicks there are as part of say nest recording for the British Trust for Ornithology, I'm not allowed to go up to or climb down to a nest of a peregrine unless I have uh, a special license. And that special license allows experienced peregrine researchers or, or people who want to record more about the, the nesting behaviour of the peregrines to go down and what have you. So it gives them an extra layer of protection that um, me, just gives them a better chance of, of survival, really. Wow, and so they've got that protection, which is brilliant. But you asked the question about, are they doing well everywhere? Well, the answer is no. So when the results of the last peregrine survey, which was done in... Uh, when was it done now sort of eight years ago or so the results of that showed actually that peregrine recovery is quite patchy so they're doing very well in southern England they're doing very well in urban locations but along parts of the coastline for example along Devon and Cornwall and parts of Wales and as you move into northern England and Scotland there are actually declines in peregrines and at the moment it's put down there's a brilliant paper by um, Wilson et al. a couple of years ago now, was it last year it came out? Two years ago, I think. And it was all about the fact that it's thought to be due to habitats, not, you know, the habitat not being as good quality as it used to be, prey species declining, so things like skylark, metapipit, lapwing, golden plover being in a, in a lesser abundance, really. Uh, and also the fact that there's still illegal persecution on sort of open moorland and, and very, very open areas where there's less people around to see that illegal behavior going on mm -hmm. so there's a real dichotomy with peregrines in that they are doing very well in many parts of of the uk but but in many remote and coastal and upland areas of britain they're not they're not doing so well so it's um i think it's always a sort of message really of of not being complacent it's always about seeing that bigger picture and celebrating the urban peregrine, for example, mm. but also just being aware of that bigger picture. Okay, and has the, the spread of, uh, you mentioned sort of buzzards and, and kites earlier, has the spread of common buzzards and red kites had an effect on them and, and their distribution or? There's no, there's no evidence of that yet. I mean, I sometimes meet people who, who are worried that, that, you know, the abundance of red kites, for example, where they might be, say, in Oxfordshire or somewhere like that, or Wiltshire, you know, they're worried about that uh, a conflict between them. But there isn't evidence of that. Red kites and buzzards are both scavengers. They, in their own right, have their own sort of niches that, that shouldn't really sort of overlap. Peregrines, on the other hand, are a fast aerial predator catching live prey. So 
there's no evidence really that there, that there is a, a, a conflict or a problem at all between the increase in red kites and buzzards. And indeed, when you look at where these decreases in the peregrine is happening, it's happening in places where perhaps actually there's also very much lower densities of buzzards and red kites anyway. Right, okay. Um, and with, we, we were touching on webcams earlier, and with the webcams on urban peregrines, um, do we know what they're, they're currently up to? I mean, obviously right now they're going to be uh, sitting on eggs, as you, as you touched on. Um, and then what's their sort of process through the year? When will, when will their eggs be hatching? How long do the, the chicks stay with them? When will they fledge? And where will they go? Can these cameras reveal yeah. information like this? So one thing that's really interesting is that 30 years ago, peregrines generally laid eggs towards the end, right towards the end of March and early April. And what we're seeing with, particularly with urban dwelling peregrines, is that they're laying eggs now as early as the end of the first week of March into mid-April which is really quite remarkable. There is a range of course and so there are still some peregrines like I think the Leeds peregrines have only just laid their first egg so there is still a range but amazingly peregrines are certainly appearing to be laying earlier and I think that has been backed up also by the British Trust for Ornithology looking at some of that, that the laying date um, numbers really and, that, and that's in line with other birds like great tits as well which are laying earlier and earlier with our, I guess our warming springs and warming climate. So April would be a month really of incubation and, and those eggs are incubated for over 30 days really, about sort of 35 days, maybe more. And then they'll be hatching early May and the chicks grow very quickly actually. An egg of a peregrine is a little bit smaller than a, a chicken egg really, perhaps more sort of bantam size or a little bit bigger than a bantam egg size, but not as big as a, a, a chicken egg. And um, so when those chicks hatch, they take, well, it's a good sort of six weeks or more in the nest, really. So the first two weeks, they've got their first coat of down and they can still be quite vulnerable to the cold and wet weather. So if it's wet or cold outside, you'll still see mum or dad um, covering them over really to keep them warm and dry and also sheltered from very hot sunshine. And then they develop a, a second coat of down, a thicker coat of down in mid, mid, mid around sort of mid-May time. And from then onwards, really, you'll, you start to see on the web cameras their darker feathers starting to grow through the fluff, basically. Mm. And then as we get into sort of early to mid-June, they start getting to the point where they'll start perhaps fledging or, or exploring the nest a bit more it depends what the nest box is if the next box is actually on a flat open roof they'll go wandering and if there is not very much beneath the nest i.e a drop below then they may hopefully if there's not too many chicks in this hang on until their kind of first flight around and that's when they're at their most vulnerable really they often do end up grounded and so peregrine champion groups or, or perhaps individuals that watch the birds often have to then go and rescue them and get them up to a higher level so that they're away from cars and people and things like that. Blimey, it must be a, a very daunting prospect if you're a newly, um, well, not even, just about to fledge, if you're a young chick and you're thinking about taking your first flight, standing at the very top of a cathedral or wondering, you know, the only way is, is down if you get it wrong. Um, and sometimes very often they do get it wrong i've got it you know it's for me it's a real celebration that peregrines are in urban locations it's allowed me to do a lot of research about them and what they eat and all sorts of things like that where they disperse but i think that the most worrying time is always that that time when they're just fledging and like you say often they do get it wrong and end up on the ground and of course you know if, if that's on the coast and they end up in the sea they're very good at swimming back to the beach uh, if they're in a quarry then uh, as long as there's no foxes around that again they can just sit on the ground and, and you know gradually get themselves back into the air but in an urban location where you've got lots of cars and people and obstacles it's a much more challenging environment actually for an urban peregrine so that's when they're most vulnerable just when they're fledging in urban locations after that kind of initial fledging period though they hone those hunting skills mum and dad bring in live prey which they kind of release for the chicks to then uh, chase after and catch themselves and then as you get into july and august time those young birds start to disperse they start exploring their local area and by the time you get to september october time often they may not be around they might be but but often they are then dispersing and exploring the countryside and they may still come back throughout the winter and the springtime um, and occasionally we're seeing now 
just a single sibling sometimes being allowed back to help mum and dad rear the following year's chicks. So we're seeing that happen more often really? at, at urban locations as well, yeah. That's extraordinary. Um, so they, they presumably go and have to establish their own territory um, then, and, and I, is it uh, a nearby territory or do they, you know, fly for miles? Or, yeah, so, it's, so that's a really good kind of link actually for me to show you. So what we do is when the chicks are about three weeks old, we put these little colourings on their legs. Mm. So under licence that I mentioned earlier, we put these colourings on their legs. We work with the British Mountaineering Council to go down to the nests. And so we can follow the birds and see where they go. Um, we also have to put on a, a metal ring as well. So this metal ring, make sure it's the white way round, this metal ring's put on, and we have to do that for the British Trust for Orthology. So that bird, that ring will stay on the bird until perhaps it's found dead uh, or something. And the colour ring is, a, is an additional ring that, that we put on to be able to identify the birds from a distance. And okay. so out of over 140 peregrines that we've ringed, for example, around the Bristol and Bath and Devon area, we've heard back from about 50 of those birds. And often in their first year or two, and what we find really is that the male peregrines don't tend to move very far. So in Bath, for example, there's a male who hasn't moved at all. He ha was hatched in Bath uh, in, in about 2007, and he's still there now 13 years later as the breeding <laughs> male. So he's an extreme example of not going anywhere, but many male birds move a bit further, maybe 20, 30 miles or so, sometimes further, sometimes 100 miles. And what we're finding is that female peregrines move much, much further. So they might be moving 60, 70, 80, over 100 miles away. Wow. So we had one, one chick that was fledged in Exeter, for example, in Devon, and that one was found in Halifax in Yorkshire. We have a female that was hatched in Bath and she headed over to Norwich and she's now the breeding female in Norwich after she chased off uh, the breeding female. She unfortunately killed actually a few of the chicks um, from that particular breeding year and then took over as the breeding female the following year. So the colour ringing really gives us a chance to find out, you know, what these birds are up to. So we know that in the West Country, for example, a lot of young peregrines are dispersing in kind of a northeast direction they're heading into uh, more sort of emptier vacant parts of the country where peregrines are living in a much lower density right and is that that's presumably because they've got more food availability for them less competition yeah i think so well it, so males don't tend to move too far as i say and i think that's that's a mechanism to stop inbreeding going on so the females will always move further than the males so that they're seeking um genetically different males basically but also i think what's going on is that the east of the country and the northeast of britain have up until very recently had had much bigger gaps so when peregrines started to recover from the effects of pesticides and persecution in the 1980s i think there was a stronger population of peregrines already in the west of britain basically mm. So these birds have just taken time to gradually move. And so there's, there's still kind of vacant areas in the northeast and east of the country. The female birds are looking for males. So the males are the ones that hold territory and it's the females that do the choosing. So the females are going around the countryside, all, all towns and cities, looking for males. And what we're seeing happening now, particularly perhaps more in southern England and the Midlands, is that there's quite a high density of peregrines and non-breeding birds called floaters. So often where there's a pair of peregrines that are nesting, in the shadows on the outskirts, there are often um, non-breeding male, male or females that are hoping for a chance. And so they might sometimes move in and try fighting with the breeding pair or one of the breeding pair to try and muscle their way in, basically. So we're starting to see much, much more much greater social interactions now between peregrines because there's basically more competition for space and for nesting locations mm. and things like that. Of course, yeah. And are they staying in their newly established territories year round? Or, and I mean, do peregrines migrate? Do they have uh, strongholds in the UK and stay here all year round? Or Yeah, so the, per the peregrine's Latin name is Falco peregrinus, which means the wanderer. And that relates to its lifestyle in Northern Europe, for example, and North America, where it's highly migratory. So peregrines that breed in Alaska will winter in, say, Peru and Chile, 
And peregrines that breed in very northern Siberia will winter in Iraq, for example, and India. But in Britain, because we are because we're, we have a very warm, moist climate in the winter, peregrines don't have any need to migrate. So in the mountains in Scotland, they might come down to lower areas, for example. But generally, we just see a much more natural dispersal. We don't see a migratory pattern. Mm. We just see them perhaps dispersing. So, yeah, you, basically, peregrines generally hang around their territories. So if you've got a pair of urban peregrines, the, the likelihood is that that male and female will hang around throughout the winter. Okay. We do have one exception to that, though, in that June last year, so June 2019, um, we had some chicks ringed um, by one of my fellow ringers, Luke Sutton, in, in Taunton in Somerset. And unbelievably, one of the chicks was discovered in November, so it's July, August, September, no, so five months later, in Morocco. Wow. And, oh but that is incredibly unusual. That is incredibly unusual. That was the first record of a British peregrine going to mainland North Africa. Uh, up until that point, there had been a peregrine that had gone from Britain to the Canary Islands. But this, this bird from Taunton was the first peregrine to actually go to North Africa from Britain. So very unusual. But generally, they are, they're very much local, local birds. But they will switch around territories. So in their lifetime, a female peregrine might have three or four different partners and a male peregrine might have two or three different partners and they won't always stay in the same nesting location. So a female peregrine, for example, might nest in one location for a year or two with, um, you know, or, or more, maybe up to 10 years, maybe with one or two different partners. And then she might change her nesting location and go and breed with a different male somewhere else. So often when we talk about our peregrines or a particular town or city's peregrines, we're not always talking about the same individuals. Right. And people that watch them often can tell when a, there's a new male or female in town. Even if they're unrings, they can often tell by maybe differences in their plumage patterns or things like that. Mm. Wow, it's fascinating. I remember watching a, a pair of peregrines when I lived up in Scotland. I used to live up there and work as a wildlife guide. Um, and uh, most years, as you just said, they would uh, move sort of further south a little bit, we suspected, for, yeah. for the winter. And there was one year where they decided to stay. Um, and I do remember looking at them and uh, watching them one particularly cold, wet, windy, soggy morning. And they both looked very much like they regretted their decision uh, to stay up there. <laughs> <laughs> for, for they the they're a bit like owls and other birds, <laughs> but they don't like the wet very much. So they just stand yeah. there and get Doggy. Yeah, they were looking very sorry for themselves, and uh, the sort of female was looking to the male as sort of to say, Who, "Whose idea was this?" That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, but uh, they, they were wonderful to watch. And um, you've been studying their their diet in urban locations for twenty years or so, haven't you? And, I have. Um, and what have you discovered with with what they're eating? Everyone always assumes, "Oh, it's pigeons, it's pigeons, it's pigeons." But yeah. uh, can you tell us more about it? So you're right. A lot of people just assume that peregrines eat pigeons and they certainly do eat a lot of feral, feral pigeons in particular, sometimes collared doves, stock doves, wood pigeons, but generally feral pigeons and also um, of that sometimes racing pigeons as well. But what I've discovered from looking at what they eat in urban locations is that actually half to maybe two thirds of the diet is pigeons and the rest, the remaining diet is other birds. And that's really interesting and important to know because if we are wanting to know more about why peregrines are not doing so well in certain parts of Britain or perhaps why they might be vulnerable in certain places, then actually knowing what they're eating, which is a crucial part of their ecology, is, is an, you know, it's a really important thing. If we just assume that all they eat is pigeons, then we could be missing an important cue of, of maybe why they're, they're declining in certain places, which is why I said to you earlier on that, for example, you know, in parts of Northern England, Scotland, we think that some of this decline is to do, to do with declining prey species that are not pigeon, things like golden plover, lapwing or what have you. So in urban locations, I can show you some, some so a lot of my diet work has been looking at uh, feathers, wings, skulls, that peregrines have basically plucked or snipped off. And that's what we find. So a bit gruesome but for example here is the wing of a black-tailed godwit wow. and peregrines will sometimes eat these in urban locations and so what we think is going on is that peregrines are hunting for example pigeons during the daytime but then at night time birds like black-tailed godwits and i've got here for example the skull of a little grebe 
And what we know that they are doing now, we've got confirmation of this from web cameras picking them up at night, is they're actually hunting at night. So during the daytime, peregrines are stoop hunting birds like pigeons. And then at night time, they're sitting in the shadows of a church looking for birds that are catching the light of the street lamps. And these birds are migrating over at night, like little grebes and, and what have you. And the peregrines are then going out and snatching those birds and, and bringing them back. So the prey work that I've done with other people in, across the UK as well, um, Nick Dixon in Devon and other people up at uh, Nick Brown up in Derby, for example, by looking at web camera footage and prey footage like this, we've been able to actually show that peregrines are hunting both during the day and night. Um, here's a fabulous Godwit skull, for example. Wow. See that amazing long beak there. Um, you find legs. This is the leg of a, a jackdaw, for example. Wow. And, what and else where do you there? find these? Are you finding them around the nest? Yeah. Or so about there we go. And about on streets. So these feathers, for example, are from a wimbrel, which is like a small cousin of the curlew. And when the peregrines are up in the church or a cathedral, they are plucking the prey. So these are feathers, for example, from a, a red shank. And so when they're plucking those feathers, they fall to the ground and we can find those on the ground below. And then when the peregrines have actually fledged their young and the nest isn't under protection any longer, we can also go up to those roofs and, and nesting locations and actually find some of these prey remains as well. And um, it's pretty remarkable that we've got a snipe, there's a snipe skull there as well. Oh, yeah. But what we're discovering really is that the per urban dwelling peregrines, certainly across the UK, feed on a whole variety of prey, over a hundred different species really. And there is a commonality when you start looking at the fact that they are eating things like lapwings, teal duck, golden plovers, um, things, whole variety of different wading birds, like the godwits and red shank I just showed you. Um, mm. is a common prey item. And small birds are often harder to find because they have smaller, lighter feathers that blow away more easily. But again, we can find those. And also with the help of web cameras, we're seeing peregrines now bringing back things like chaffinches and goldfinches and, and logging those kind of smaller birds that just with prey remains are much harder to find. Oh, of course. And do they um, regurgitate pellets as some of the birds do, birds of prey do? Yeah, um, they do. You can go they through do these pellets. as well. They're not... I don't find them quite as helpful for finding out about their diet. If you're studying the diet, for example, of a tawny owl or barn owl, it'd be full of skulls and bones of what they've been eating. But in a peregrine, they just tend to be a mass of, of often the smaller, fluffier feathers, often of pigeons. They do sometimes contain skulls and bones, and sometimes they'll contain more striking feathers, like, for example, of a water rail, stripy side feathers of a water rail, or the stripy feathers of a till, for example. But the pellets aren't always as useful. What is useful is finding the actual kind of physical remains, the wings, the skulls, the legs, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And up until recently, really, a lot of my work has been, as I say, with Nick Dixon in Devon and uh, Nick Brown and Nick Moyes up in, 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 in Derby. But what I'm doing now really is tapping into lots of different people across the country who are monitoring urban locations. And so as part of a part-time PhD this autumn, I want to actually start looking at the prey of peregrines from over 90 locations in Britain so that I can actually build up a much better idea and, and, and build up a much better generalisation, I guess, of what urban peregrines are, are really eating, really. Because up until now, it's been just three or four, maybe five locations, which you know isn't as representative of the whole of the UK as it could be. So by getting prey remains from across 90 different locations, almost 100 locations now, we can hopefully really build up a good picture of, of what, what's making urban peregrines tick and also perhaps look at why they are doing so well in urban locations compared to maybe some of their rural counterparts. Wow, that sounds fascinating. And, and what, just going back to the, the prey uh, that we were talking about a second ago, what's the largest prey item that has been recorded that you know of? So, yeah, that's a good question. So in, uh, in an urban location, the largest prey that you tend to find are things like wood pigeon and teal duck. And I think that's simply because anything larger than that is too heavy to fly back to a church or a building. So you have to, you have to look out at more rural locations like wetlands, for example. And so when you start looking at um, a wetland, um, where there's lots of ducks and water birds and things like that, then peregrines are capable of bringing down birds like little egrets, 
Um, they have been known to bring down things like grey lag geese, um, Brent geese, and geese. even grey herons. Um, I've not known those in recent times, but in recent times I do know of birds such as, as I say, little egrets and um, and things like widgeon duck are taken much, much more frequently in a rural location such as a wetland. But I think they're just a little bit too heavy sometimes for a peregrine to, to bring back to an urban location. So quite big. What I think is even more fascinating, though, is how a peregrine can actually catch some of the smaller birds. So from time to time, we do record things like wrens and gold crests and small birds like siskins in the diet so they're quite capable like a sparrowhawk really mm. of of catching very very small birds as well wow i find that absolutely phenomenal just the the image in my mind right now of a peregrine trying to wrestle with a goose i know <laughs> um, is, is quite remarkable uh, another interesting bit of behavior is little grebes I, I i showed you here's my little grebe skull just here so they'll eat little grebes and we know that they will catch those at night but I do know, and I've seen some footage of this, where peregrines will also wait for little grebes to come up from a dive and then try and grab them off the water. So they have two techniques for catching little grebes. They catch them on migration at night, but they'll, they'll also get them off the water as well, which when you think about it, then they don't hover quite like a kestrel yeah. does. But to be able to manoeuvre over the water and hover to a degree to be able to catch a water bird, I think it's pretty impressive, really. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And and. and mm. You've touched on this slightly already, but what's next for peregrines, do you think? What's next for peregrines? Well, I think in urban locations, it's it's more of them, really. I think that we're going to see much more habitation, you know, them taking up more urban locations across across the UK, really. So if a, if a town or a city doesn't have them yet, then I think that over the next sort of five, five years, even not even 10 years, but over the next five years, they will they will start to see them appearing not necessarily nesting because quite often on urban locations they need a helping hand sometimes they need a nest box or something like that and otherwise their net their eggs often just roll into the gutter so sometimes they do need a helping hand if perhaps local groups or local wildlife people feel it's fit and sometimes putting up a nest box on an urban location isn't always the most appropriate thing to do it depends on perhaps the local community and whether there might be conflicts with having peregrines nesting in a location with racing pigeon fans for example so a nest box isn't always the solution but can be the solution i think that we also need to be thinking more about or, or monitoring really, I guess, what's going on with rural peregrines really. So I think what's next is that we're going to see hopefully an increase in peregrines using our urban locations. But I think with continuing, continuing declines in woodland birds and farmland birds, and moorland birds, for example, we need to be, we need our finger on the pulse really with keeping an eye on what's going on with some of our rural and uh, more, more rural moorland and coastal peregrines really to make sure that we understand what's going on and why and and that's why i think knowing about the diet's important although obviously my work is much more on the urban peregrine but you know if we can understand what's making the urban peregrine tick we can maybe try and understand why the rural peregrine's not doing so well and they have been studied in greater detail their diet has been studied in greater detail um over the last sort of 10 20 30 years or so so there are comparisons that, that can be made I think also with technology, I think there's just greater access for people enjoying these birds more so than, you know, even though many of us might see sparrowhawks in a local park or our garden, I think there's peregrines are much more predictable birds. So there's much greater engagement of people watching these birds on web cameras or being able to go into town and actually see them on a building and, and really enjoy watching these birds. Mm. And of course, most people are staying at home at the moment during these weeks of self-isolation and they're only able to get out once a day at most for a walk. So how can we increase our chances of seeing a peregrine falcon? Yeah, really good question. Well, do you know what? It's about just keeping your eyes and ears peeled overhead. So when I was going for a walk in the Forest of Dean, just very close to my house last week, I saw a peregrine on two occasions and it was simply by looking up, being aware of what was going overhead. There was the odd buzzard going overhead. There was the odd gull going overhead. And then one of those birds happened to be a peregrine. So it's about just keeping your eyes and ears peeled. As, as I mentioned earlier on, if you're in somewhere like a city, like Bristol or Bath or uh, Nottingham, it's about just being aware of what's around and overhead and 
in many cities now, as I mentioned earlier on, you are more likely to see a peregrine than you are a sparrowhawk or a kestrel or a buzzard. So it's just looking up, looking around, particularly on a good, clear, sunny day, perhaps when there's a bit of a breeze, because birds of prey love having a bit of wind and breeze around them or what have you. And looking, as I say, for a, a bird of prey with those long pointy wings, this kind of shallow wing beat flying, um, quite bulky breasts. And if you go on to um, a website like the RSPBs, or for example, there's a web called Zeno Canto, which is X-E-N-O dash Canto, C-A-N-T-O dot org. It's got a whole audio encyclopedia of birds. And if you look up the peregrine, you'll be able to listen to the calls of the peregrine. And that's another really good thing. If you get familiar with the call of the peregrine, it's again a sound that you might hear and look up and suddenly have a peregrine flying overhead. Wow, magical. I know I'll certainly be keeping an eye out and uh, an ear out when I'm next going on my walks uh, on my lunch break over the, the coming few weeks. Mm. <laughs> Ed, I feel like I've been by your side with my binoculars while learning from you. Uh, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic my to pleasure. chat to you. And thank you so much for that insight uh, into the world's fastest bird. Um, for listeners at home, we hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast and that we've brightened your day somewhat. Uh, if you're keen to learn more, um, about urban peregrines so you can buy ed's book called urban peregrines which is sold by pelagic publishing <laughs> which you can see on the screen now if you're watching the, uh, the webinar um, and ed we hope to, to touch base with you again soon um, yeah lovely thanks sarah and Keep thanks well. so much for joining us thank you and if you want to join ed on a wildlife tour you can see his upcoming trips on his profile on our website the link to which is displayed on your screen now and to listen to more of our podcasts, just go to our podcast page at naturetrek.co.uk forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.